Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'd like you to turn with me, please, once again to Nehemiah. We're in chapter 4 right now, Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 10 down to verse 18. And while you're turning there, I just want to give a warm welcome to all our visitors and also the local saints. Just so good to see everybody out this evening. Thank you for that good, hearty singing as well. It was very delightful. Beginning in verse 10, it says this, And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence you shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore set I the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the harbagans, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall, and they that bare burdens, and those that laid it, every one, with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one, had his sword girded by his side, and so build it, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this evening. Well, we've been uh, looking at uh, this uh, project of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, of removing the reproach that had laid there for many years. And as they began to build, we said that when we get serious about wanting to build for God, the enemy will also get serious in trying to stop us. And when we began looking at chapter 4, uh, we said that uh, the main theme of this chapter is opposition from without. But this persistent opposition from without began to cause discouragement within. And of course, uh, it's a difficult thing when the workers are feeling discouraged. Energy levels are depleted when you're discouraged. Everything's an effort. It's just hard to move forward when you're discouraged. And the enemy knows that. And, and one of the chief enemies of our souls is discouragement. And that's why we said in assemblies, we need a few Barnabases around, right? Sons of encouragement that can come alongside and encourage God's people. And so there's a lot of discouragement. And we read here that uh, part of the discouragement is because there's too much rubbish. Notice again in verse 10, Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. The first thing is that they're tired. They're, 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 we'd said earlier that they've got half of the job done. Uh, the, the walls are half built. But there's a lot of work gone into that. And as a result of that, the people are getting tired. I find that when I'm most prone to discouragement is when I'm tired. It, it, we need our rest. You know, when we're tired, the enemy loves to attack us. You see that in the book of Numbers, that, that when Amalek came, of course, a picture of the flesh, and, and began to exert influence, it was a, a, against the stragglers and those that were weary. And so we're always in a dangerous place when we're tired. Uh, I found the best thing to do when I'm tired is go to bed and sleep. <laughs> Get an early night, you know, kind of those kind of things. But it really is tiredness, discouragement. They seem to go hand in hand. And the enemy seems to know that and know how to attack. And so we certainly see here that they're tired, but it says there's so much rubbish. And I want to just think about this because, uh, you know, there's a lot of rubble. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar 
had come. He had knocked down the walls, and they just had laid there. Uh, basically for, for years, and so there's just all this rubble. And in some ways, I suppose it'd be a lot quicker if you just built on the heaps of rubble, but it wouldn't be very stable, would it? But you see, in order to rebuild the walls, what they've got to do is they've got to lay a proper foundation. You're going to build anything. Foundation is everything, isn't it? You've got to have the proper foundation. Build on a right foundation. And so in order to do that, you've got all this rubble that has to be removed. And so uh, that's tiring in itself. You, you feel like you're not making any progress because all you're doing is removing old rubbish. And you, you have to do that before you can build up. And, and I, I want to just suggest to you that that's, a, that's a, a challenge in assembly life too. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes it's easier to start a new work than it is to revive an old work because there's a lot of rubbish. And what I mean by a lot of rubbish is there's a lot of bad feeling. You know, people <laughs> in assembly fellowship rubbing shoulders close together, if you get close enough and you work hard enough, you get friction. And there's a lot, sometimes people find it hard to get over these things. Broken relationships, bitterness. Somebody said something to me 25 years ago, I can't get over it. And so it's really hard to build when you've, you've got all this rubble, and sometimes it's just easier to say, forget it, I'm going to go start a new work. I'm going to pioneer. That seems a lot more exciting because you're starting with fresh material. But nevertheless, God is in the business of removing rubbish if we let him. And so we want to think about some of these things. I just want to illustrate the principle of if we're going to build upwards, we have to first of all go downwards to get to the foundation. Just a couple of illustrations. Because uh, we, we mentioned yesterday about the judgment seat of Christ and uh, that passage in 1 Corinthians 3, it says there's no foundation uh, other than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. He's the rock on which we build. But I'd like you just to look at Luke 6 just for a moment, please. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. And I want you just to see something very interesting here. Uh, when our children were younger, and of course sometimes when they were really little, we'd use you know, kind of uh, little children's picture books, uh, Bible books and things like that that would have Bible stories. And of course, the one of the wise man building his house on the rock and the foolish man on his sand, you know, it's a proverbial one that you would read. But um, it's what's interesting is usually those children's books have this picture of the guy on the sand, he's on a flat surface, and here's the guy building on a rock, and it's kind of like he's building it up on this rock or this kind of big mountaintop or something, and there he's building his house. That is not the picture the Bible is conveying at all. Look at Luke 6. I just want you to notice something here. Verse 46. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, and notice this, and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth and against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Now you notice the difference? This is not building upon a rock up here, it's digging deep, right? It's the idea of, of when you dig foundations, usually you go down before you ever go up, don't you? And we could say this, that if we're really going to build for God, we need solid foundations ourselves. We need to dig deep before we'll ever go up, right? We need to have sure foundations. And of course, when we have uh, rubble uh, around us um, uh, and all the rubbish that can accumulate over a history of an assembly uh, and people get emotionally attached to the rubbish it's amazing uh, unbiblical things that have come in and and maybe traditions that have no basis in scripture and and to clean that out and to start on a fresh let's go back to scripture is a very very challenging thing because people will defend the existence of heaps of rubbish as if it's the word of God itself. And it's just rubbish. And so sometimes we've got to clean the stuff out if we're going to really build. And I, I think of uh, historically. 
You think of things like uh, every revival in the history of the church seems to have been the first place is a removal of the rubble. So the Reformation, which was clearly a, a revival, but they had a thousand years of human tradition, right? That had all through the Dark Ages, all this tradition that had built up. And, and what did they have to do? You have to clear out that rubble before you build on the right foundation, which is what? It's justification by faith in Christ. Uh, you get to the Methodist revival, and they had this idea that uh, you couldn't evangelize outside the walls of a church. Everything had to be done on consecrated ground. And, and along comes Wesley, and when he hears his friend Whitfield is preached in the open air, he's absolutely horrified at the thought of it. How would he do such a thing? And then he began reading in the scriptures and he read the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus was on the mountaintop and he began to teach and he began to realize, oh, maybe, maybe it's okay to preach in the open air. And so again, rubble of human tradition and human ideas had to be swept away before a true building for God took place. And we could go on all the way through back in the 1800s. We'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow night. But, but again, uh, the, the, there had been... Uh, centuries of tradition and about 150 well it'll be 200 years ago now uh, a group of men said let's just go back to the simplicity of scripture let's let's get rid of the rubble and let's just go back to the book and it was revolutionary it was an amazing thing and, and so again if we want to build there has to be a clearing out of rubble and a getting back to the foundation and then, of course, it seems like you're going backwards because you're, you're getting the foundation right. Remember, uh, when we were first in Ireland and we were trying to get a work going, and we had basically two years of corrective teaching that was absolutely essential to get a proper foundation. And after two years of corrective teaching, teaching then we began to seriously evangelize, and the Lord began to bless, and the work grew and prospered, but it took two years. And it's hard to write a prayer letter to say, well, what are you doing in Ireland? Well, we're actually correcting error. Uh, two years of it, you know, that's, uh, it's hard to write that in a letter, but it was essential. And uh, I know my son in Norway is finding exactly the same thing. You're going to build, you have to have a proper foundation, and rubbish has to be cleared out before you can go up. And so this is, and that's discouraging because it seems like you're going backwards, not forwards. And this is what's discouraging them. There's much rubbish. We're not able to build the wall. And we said, what a tragic conclusion they came to. This is the first kind of message of defeatism in the whole account. Up to now, uh, there's been a united front. We can build. We're going to build for God. And now the first message of dissent coming from Judah of all people. And they say uh, that we're not able to build the wall. And that's all it takes, isn't it? A few people who are casting, as it were, doubt on the project, who are, are discouragers, you know, say it's just not possible. Oh, yeah, it's okay talking about this revival, but it, it could never happen. We're in the last days now. Forget that idea of revival. Forget, you know, just kind of white-knuckle ride, let's hold on till the rapture. That's the mentality today, right? Let, don't talk about these kind of things. Discouragement. Defeatism. It's not the language of the Lord Jesus when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he didn't put a time frame on that. He's still building. Souls are still being saved, still being added. The work is still going on. In places all over the world, there's great things happening. And, and sometimes we can kind of succumb to this defeatist mentality like Judah yeah, it's, there's so much rubbish, so we're not able to build the wall. And if that's your mentality, you won't build. You just won't. <laughs> but if you, if you have a vision and you have faith in God, you can build. And so notice it says in verse 11, our adversaries said, they shall not know neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. So their strategy was kind of, uh, uh, they united together, the enemies 
And it was kind of like a guerrilla warfare. What, what they said is, uh, we're going to attack the wall. You're not going to know where it's going to be. It could be at any place at any moment, and it, it's impossible for you to be able to defend this. That's, that's what they're threatening. They're threatening attacks that could come from any place, and not just that. It says, um, we'll come in the midst of them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Verse 11, it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places, when you shall return unto us, they will be upon us. So there's, there's these rumors going around that, that the, those that came from other places to help build the wall, as you're coming in, you're going to be attacked. And wherever, whichever direction you're coming, we're going to get you. And so there's all these threats. And of course, the enemy loves to threaten, doesn't he? And he loves to discourage uh, uh, the work of God. So it says, therefore... Uh, this is how he responds, verse 13, Nehemiah, good leadership here. I set in the lower places behind the wall, the higher places. I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And so now what he does is he arms the workers. C.H. Spurgeon, will mention him a couple of times in this message, just ironically, just because it, it comes up very relevantly. But Spurgeon, uh, it was interesting that he produced a magazine when he was at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And that magazine was called The Sword and Trowel. Where do you think he got that idea from? Well, it was the book of Nehemiah. And the idea is this, that we have a sword in one hand because we're in a battle, we're in a warfare, but we have a trowel in the other hand because we're building for God. And so that's the picture that you have in the book of Nehemiah, a sword and a trowel. Uh, we're building, but we're also ready to fight and defend, and particularly defend our families. Uh, so it says, I've set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, their bows. You think they're going to fight hard because of their families being there? I think you're going to really fight hard, aren't you, to defend your families. And so he, he sets them, he arms them, all the rest of it. And so I want you to notice now verse 14. For, verse 14 is a very critical verse. Because in the midst of all this discouragement and opposition, we just read this little phrase, and I looked. Now this is Nehemiah, and all he says is, and I looked. Then it says, and rose up and said to the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them, remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Now, it doesn't tell us where he looked. It just says, and I looked. But I wonder if you could guess where he might have looked. When all around is discouragement, all around is the enemy's threats and the enemy's bluster, where do you think he might have looked? I think I know exactly where he would have looked, right? He would have looked to the Lord. And as he looks to the Lord, yeah, this, this, these threats are real, these enemies are real, but he gets his eyes off the difficulties, off the circumstances, and he gets them focused on the Lord. Is that good biblical advice? <laughs> I think it's wonderful advice, isn't it? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's a good place to look. Look at 2 Chronicles just for a minute and chapter 12. 2 Chronicles 12 is another similar situation. It's the King Jehoshaphat. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you find that uh, there's a massive army coming against Judah. And it almost seems that odds are absolutely overwhelming. And yet we read this. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, O our, oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. We don't have any might. <laughs> We can't win this. We're overwhelming odds. But our eyes are upon you. 
Now, when your eyes are upon the Lord, what is a massive army coming against you, against the Lord of hosts, right? He, can he handle this? Oh, of course he can. And so what we need to recognize is that when we're facing many challenges, maybe an enemy that's really kind of putting pressure on us, uh, maybe discouragement in the assembly, what's your advice? Well, the advice would be simple. Get your eyes off the circumstances and get them on the Lord. And if you get your eyes on the Lord, then I think you'll have every reason to be encouraged rather than discouraged. Mr. Spurgeon was asked if he ever got discouraged. He said, not for the past 20 years. And somebody said to him, can you explain that? How come you've never been discouraged for the last 20 years? He said, I don't allow 15 minutes ever to go by without thinking about Christ. Wow, isn't that amazing? Not being discouraged for 20 years because I never allow 15 minutes to go by without thinking about Christ. Just look at Isaiah 42 just for a second. One of the marvelous servant songs in the prophecy of Isaiah that speak about Messiah, the, the true servant of Jehovah. And these servant songs are absolutely marvelous, a beautiful study in and of itself. But I want you to notice, he says in verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment or justice to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Bruised reed shall he not break. The smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. And notice verse 4. This is the verse I have in mind. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Now just notice, just two simple thoughts here. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged. And of course, that's the Lord Jesus, right? He is the servant of Jehovah. And what it tells me is, I might be discouraged, but he's not discouraged. I might feel like everything's failing, but he shall not fail. And so if I get my focus from me and the circumstances on him, then surely that would encourage us, right? Because he's not going to fail, nor is he going to be discouraged. And he's going to accomplish everything that he set out to accomplish. And so we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. And so it's so important for us to do that in the midst of battle and all the rest of it. And we notice uh, further on as we go into this uh, chapter, it, it, he says uh, from verse 15, it came to pass when our enemies heard, for it was known unto us that God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one to his work. And basically, uh, what happened is, uh, with this new strategy of the sword and trowel, maybe it slowed down the building work a little bit, because, uh, you know, you, you, you've got a sword, <laughs> kind of a bit cumbersome, as well as your building stuff, so it's slowing things down, but at least it's allowing them to get back to work. They've got this confidence now, if the enemy comes, they, they have a sword in their hand if they need it to, to counteract the enemy. And by the way, it's good for us as we build, we have a sword that is very, very sharp that we can use in building and clearing away the rubbish. Because how did the rubbish in the Reformation get cleared away? Well, it was when the Word of God came to light. It was the sword that cut out all the rubbish. And, and so, again, we could say sword and trowel, very, very important. Builders and burden bearers carrying weapons, he set up an alarm system, the blowing of the trumpets, so that if somebody attacked at a certain place, everybody would gather to that point. And so as a result of it, they were able to keep on building. So I just want you to notice verse 17, they which builded on the wall. Verse 21, so we labored in the work. And the point is this, just to, to kind of summarize, despite the opposition from without, it did not stop the work. The work continued 
The building continued. They were able to, as it were, defeat the enemy. And again, we just need to realize we're in a war. Uh, we have weapons. Uh, we have armor. We have a very wicked enemy. But we can still build for God. But we have to remember, and I think in the Western world, part of the difficulty is that we have forgotten that maybe we're on a battleship and many of us think we're on a cruise ship. We're on a battleship. We're in a war. And we need to be ready for the enemy. And seek to build for God and expect opposition. So that's chapter 4. Now I want to move on to chapter 5. I know we're not covering every verse. But I feel like we need to kind of proceed into chapter 5. Because chapter 5 is even more kind of sad in many ways. Because this chapter, we find something which almost wrecked the whole project. And it was not an external enemy, because you'll find that in this chapter, there's no mention of Sanballat, or Tobiah, or Geshem, the Arabian. Not at all. What you find in this chapter is that there's internal dissension. The enemy is not attacking from outside. The saints are attacking one another inside. And the fight is against the wrong enemy. They're actually fighting one another rather than fighting the real enemy. And it's tragic. So this internal dissension among the people had nothing to do with external enemies. The people who were once so united in objective became divided. And so we would say this, that even though there's no physical enemy mentioned, we always have to say that ultimately, when the saints begin to fight each other, actually, what's going on? It's the flesh, which is a real enemy, right? It's an internal enemy, but it's a real enemy. Galatians, we, we haven't got there yet, but in our study of Galatians, we're going to get to a point where he says that, 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 that Galatians were in danger of biting and devouring one another. And he says, take heed that you're not consumed one of another. And he says, you're behaving like a pack of wild dogs. You're actually eating each other. And these are, these are believers. But they're believers that are operating in the energy of the flesh. And as a result of that, there's internal conflict. And of course, uh, one of the chief weapons of the enemy... It's always the same. It's divide and conquer. We mentioned already, but if you look at the book of Acts, there's external opposition, and you see that very clearly. But then there's chapter 6 is a very dangerous chapter because the enemy has come in in a very subtle way. And I always find this amazing. Just look there for a second, just at Acts 6, because it has a very great relevance to chapter 5 here in Nehemiah. It's kind of like the New Testament version of what's going on in Nehemiah. And just notice in Acts chapter 6, we just notice a few little comments here uh, that, that are worth um, considering. It says, verse 1, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So here's a potential division, and it's, it's basically amazing to me when you think about it that these people have so much in common. So they're, they're Hebrew and Grecian. We would say the Grecians more would be Hellenistic Jews and Hebrew Jews. They're all Jews right now. At this point, no Gentiles in the church. Right? We don't get Gentiles till chapter 10. They're all Jews. So what do they have in common? They're Jews. They're widows. They've both lost the love of their lives, right? You'd think, wow, they've got great reason to be united, right? Because, and they're Jews that have believed that Jesus is the rightful Messiah of Israel, and they believed in him as well. So they've got all this common ground, lots to work with, lots to build on. 
What does the enemy do? One group feels like the other group is getting better treatment. Right? One group feels they've been neglected. And maybe there was, uh, you know, in those days, uh, there was no Canada pension or anything like that. And so sometimes if a widow was left, she, she was dependent on the care of the church. And, and so, uh, of course, those that had spent their lives, uh, the Hellenistic Jews, they'd been in the diaspora, the dispersion, they'd been amongst the Gentiles, they'd come back in uh, to Israel, and uh, they, um, you know, they spoke a different language, kind of uh, Greek was there, they had a different Bible translation, they used the Septuagint translation, whereas the rest used the Hebrew Bible. So there's all these, you know, oh, they're different, and they're getting a different treatment. And it almost caused the beautiful harmony of the early church to be destroyed. And it took a very special wisdom on the part of the apostles in setting up seven men full of faith in the Holy Ghost to deal with it. And ironically, every one of those seven men that was picked has a Grecian name. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and they were able to solve the problem. And we thank the Lord for that. But we see the same thing here in Nehemiah. I want to see the background to the problem. And by the way, I say all this because, you see, amongst Christians, it's so easy to see division. In, in just in my few years, uh, I, I've seen people fight over school choices. Homeschool, public school, Christian school. I've seen people fight over Bible versions, dress codes, Sunday school, do we do one or don't we do one? And, and so the enemy just loves to magnify differences. That's his tactic. See how you're different. Not what you agree on. We all love the same Savior. He bought us at great price, right? I mean, those things are pretty important, but the focus is always on these other things. And so that's how the enemy works. And so... Again, we, we see it in 1 Corinthians 11. It's, uh, we've heard from the house of Chloe that there are dissensions amongst you. There's these internal conflicts. And oh, how the enemy knows this. We know the greatest threat to him, and we've seen this in the book of Nehemiah, is there's something powerful about a people united of one accord in one place, with one vision. That's such a powerful thing. And the enemy recognizes that. So let's look at the background to the problem here. And the problem is a food shortage in Jerusalem. Uh, caused by a large increase in population. Coupled with neglect in tilling the land. Uh, over the years of the dispersion. And now perhaps the enthusiasm in building the wall. Like who's planting crops? Who's harvesting crops? And so all of a sudden there's a food shortage. And um, people can't afford um, to buy uh, because, because there's food is in short supply. Inflation kicks in. Prices go up. I, I think we know a little bit about that, don't we? we? Some of us are experiencing that. You go to the grocery store, you get sticker shock, don't you? Uh, it's kind of amazing. So this is what's going on. And so it says, uh, let's read from verse 1. There was great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. This is no longer a cry against Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem. The cry is against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Of course, you do need food. And some also that were that said, we have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute because they're still, times of the Gentiles, they're still having to pay taxes to our tax Xerxes, the king. And so we can hardly feed ourselves. And then on top of that, we have a big tax burden as well. And in order to meet 
these requirements, we're having to mortgage our lands, our, our, our property, and, and even worse, it says, verse 5, yet now our flesh is as flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. The, the financial crisis was so great that they had to actually put their own sons and daughters into slavery in order to survive. And so this is the, the story. This is what's going on. And, and so it's some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them. We don't have the money to buy them out of slavery. For other men have our lands and vineyards. In other words, there's a massive financial crisis. And sadly, there are always people that take advantage of financial crises. And the sad thing is that in this financial crisis, the, one that, uh, the ones that are taking advantage are actually God's people themselves, the Jews, against other Jews. And uh, we just have to be honest. And, you know, sometimes I think we're, we're dishonest with ourselves. But sometimes... We have to say God's people do things that disappoint us. If you've never been disappointed by the conduct of another Christian, you will be. Because not every Christian is walking the way Christ would have them to walk. Not every Christian is filled with the Spirit. Not every Christian is under the control of the Holy Spirit. There are Christians that do fleshly things, and it happens, yes, even in assemblies. And if you haven't seen it, you will, but you probably have. You're probably thinking of specifics even as I'm speaking. I know how you work because I work the same way. I uh, probably can think of different individuals. But there's always people who take advantage of situations like that. It must have been very distressing for Nehemiah that these were his own people, the Jews, the people of God. And so, notice Nehemiah's response. And this is very, very instructive. Notice he says in verse 6, And I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Nehemiah's response is anger. Now, anger is an interesting thing because we, we have to recognize that Scripture tells us, in fact, let's just turn there for a moment in Ephesians chapter 4. I want you just to see this, that clearly all anger cannot be wrong because Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry, and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So, it tells us that there are times when it's the right response to be angry. Be ye angry. And of course, it cannot always be wrong, because the Lord Jesus was angry on more than one occasion. When he drove the money changers out of the temple, he was angry, wasn't he? Because he says, you've made my father's house into a den of thieves. And his, God's intention was it would be a house of prayer. They'd made it into a den of thieves. And so we see that, that it clearly, I know without question that my Savior was absolutely sinless. And yet he was angry. So, there's such a thing as what we call righteous anger. Of course, we have to ask the question, how do I determine which is which? <laughs> what is righteous anger and what is fleshly anger? And I would suggest to you that righteous anger is always connected with divine things and it's always about his honor, his glory. Fleshly anger is usually connected with me. Somebody's hurt me or offended me, right? It's me-centered rather than God-centered. And so he's very angry. But I want you to notice that he doesn't act immediately. 
I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words, but notice verse 7, it says, Then I consulted with myself. I like that. I consulted with myself. <laughs> what does that mean? It says to give oneself advice. Literally, that's what it means. To give oneself advice or to counsel oneself. In other words, I want you to notice what he, what he, he doesn't do. In his anger... He doesn't fly off the handle, right? He doesn't just, like a, a, an unthinking outburst of rage. He doesn't do that. Have you ever got angry and you've said something in the heat of the moment and the minute you said it, you wish you could have caught it and stuck it back in? <laughs> you know what I mean? Have you ever, maybe I'm the only one that's had that experience. I don't think so. You said something and you wish you'd never said it. Because you did it in the heat of the moment, it was angry, and it was probably a very cutting, hurting thing you said, and it probably left deep scars in the ones that heard it. And the problem was, you vented your anger rather than counseling yourself first. <laughs> have a little chat with yourself uh, when we have disciplined our children in years gone by. And um, uh, one thing that I learned early on is to send them to the room, not just for their sake, but for my sake, okay? To get myself calmed down so that I am not disciplining in a fit of anger. And then when I go talk to them, I'll say, why do you think I'm here? I want them to tell me what this is all about. And the more they do it, more calmness comes into my spirit, so the discipline is never done in anger. And it's really important that we learn to consult with ourselves. But then, you see, one example is you can jump too quickly and vent it immediately. The other thing you can do is when you're angry, don't vent it at all, but internalize it and let it fester and never say anything. And then it just eats away at you. That's just as wrong as the other. Notice that he doesn't do that. He consults with himself, and then he says, and I rebuke the nobles and the rulers. So having first got himself in a position where he's in a right state of mind, then he follows through, and he does rebuke the nobles because what they had done was wrong. And said to them, you exact usury every one of his brother, and I set a great assembly against them. And so... Very important principles here in terms of anger. Get a proper perspective. Give yourself time to evaluate the situation. De decide on a course of action. And then follow through. I rebuked the nobles, he says. He did act. And of course, there are times we, we have to act. We just dealt with this in Galatians, where Paul literally confronted Peter to the face, publicly, because what he did was not right. Right? He, he, he did it, and it needed to be done. Scripture says we're to admonish one another, to lovingly confront where necessary. And, and so it's a biblical principle. Confront when wrong. There's a time to act. And if you want uh, the work of God to be ruined, just let misunderstandings, discouragement, mistrust arise and don't deal with it and wait for the explosion because it'll fester under the sea, under the ground, and it'll come out. And so what's, what's he so mad with them for? Well, because they're exacting usury, every one of his brother. Um, they're, they're like the, the payday brokers, you know, kind of, uh, they're charging high interest rates. They're, they're kind of using the situation uh, to basically put people in great debt to them. And so how does he deal with this? How does he appeal to them? I want you to notice, again, verse 8, he said, he said to them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will you yet even sell your brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. He appeals 
on the base of redemption. He reminds them, first of all, that they as a people were a redeemed people in the first place. They'd been bought back from slavery themselves back in Egypt. But then he says, but even to get our, some of you out of captivity, we had to buy you back off your heathen masters and now you're enslaving one another. And they were silent. They, it, they just held their peace. There was nothing they could say. And so he appeals on the basis of redemption. <clears throat> just, to, just turn with me for a moment at, to Ephesians once more, chapter 4. Verse 31 and 32. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We, we need to keep in mind our redemption as we deal with others. Don't be consumed with bitterness and wrath and anger, which is easy to happen. Remember just how much God for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Can you begin to calculate that? I mean, I don't, I don't think we could even begin to... We be, and so the Holy Spirit so grieved when we refuse to forgive others that hurt us. And, and the reason he's so grieved is he knows how much you have been forgiven. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, and he sees that you've been forgiven all this much, and somebody said something to you 25 years ago, and you just can't get over it. No wonder he's so grieved. It's interesting when it said, be angry and sin not, and then it says another interesting thing. It says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. My wife and I took that as a verse early in our marriage. We... We said, we can't go to bed mad at each other. Because if we do, the next day, it won't be smaller, it'll be bigger. Right? So we made a decision that we would always pray together before we go to sleep at night. Now, I'll tell you, you can't pray when you're mad. It doesn't work. You know it's not going to get beyond the ceiling. Right? So... Sometimes it meant we didn't go to sleep for a long time. <laughs> we had to work it out. And then we prayed. And then the next morning, there's, we've never gone more than 24 hours being mad at each other because we never let the sun go down on our wrath. And it's just a simple principle. Not easy, <laughs> but it's a very simple principle, isn't it? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Because uh, I've seen over years, little things, if they're left... They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden it becomes almost irreparable. And so it's important, isn't it, to, to deal with things. So notice again, back in uh, chapter 5, he says, um, Also I said, it is not good that you do. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies. Just a couple of things that he reminds them about. First of all, walking in the fear of God. Clearly, they had lacked that holy fear for God. And again, I, I, I would say this, that we tend to think about the fear of God as being connected with the Old Testament. But clearly, as we look at the book of Acts, we see that uh, the fear of God is not just an Old Testament idea, but walking in the fear of God is something to be taken seriously. Fear of, the, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Lots of teaching on that in the Proverbs. But the book of Acts chapter 9 verse 31 says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And if I could just say this, I, I think one of the tragedies of our society as a whole is that as a society, we have lost the idea of the fear of God. Almost completely gone. But what's even more sad is, sometimes even in the house of God, the fear of God has been lost. And we need to 
walk in the fear of the Lord. And so he, he challenges them. He says to them, ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? And then he says, because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies. Uh, also, are we concerned about the, the testimony? How does that look that we are actually putting one another into slavery and under bondage to one another? How does that look to the heathen world? And that should concern us too. One walking in the fear of God, the other one is, how is my conduct to my fellow believer, how is it affecting how the unsaved world look at us? Because we are being watched. I, I know that for sure. Our own assembly, um, we had a potluck dinner and there was lots of leftover food, and so we took it round to some of the neighbors' houses. We went to the guy next door to us, and he simply said this. He said, I'm not a church-going person, but if I ever was, I'd come to your church. And so they said, well, why would that be? He said, because I can see that you people love one another. So I was really happy to hear that. Isn't that tremendous? What, what do they see when they see your assembly? Because people are watching. In the neighborhood, if you're in a neighborhood, they're watching as you come in. They're watching as you interact with each other. This guy had been there all these years. We had no idea, but he's watching us all the time. And he's coming to a conclusion. You people really love each other. Praise God for that. That's a wonderful testimony. But again, are we concerned about what the outside world think of us? I've been taken out to restaurants, not tonight, by the way, just in case anybody's wondering, but I've been taken out to restaurants, and I almost wished I could crawl under the table by the way the Christians were treating the waitress. And I remember one time I was so upset at the way they treated her, I said, please don't give her a tract. Whatever you do, do not give that woman a tract. Because it's, it's shocking sometimes the way we conduct ourselves before a watching world. Oh, I hope we conduct ourselves in a way that actually makes the doctrine of God adorned, make it look beautiful by the way we conduct ourselves. And so clearly, Nehemiah is concerned. Their conduct is, is having a negative effect because of the heathen. I likewise, verse 10, and my brethren, my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray unto you, let us leave off his, this usury. He said, I could have done that too, but I haven't. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn, the wine, and the oil uh, that you exact of them. So you pay them back. You pay them back every month and you pay 1%, 12% a year. You pay them back with interest for what you've done to them. That's what he's saying. And you know, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Just going to close with this. Our time is just about gone. But some of the great revivals in history, one of the things that has occurred has been restoration of that which had been stolen. There was a revival in Northern Ireland in, in 1926. It was under the evangelist called W.P. Nicholson. And many of the people who were converted worked at the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast. And when they got converted, many of them became deeply convicted about all the stuff they'd pilfered from work. And so they began to take it back. And as they began to take it back, so many of them were saved. There was so much stuff being taken back that Harland and Wolf made an official announcement. Please stop bringing back stolen stuff. We have nowhere to put it all. You think that left a, a good testimony behind? I know this personally. I had a friend. He was in the Irish army. And this guy was a kleptomaniac before he was saved. And when he got saved, he went to his commanding officer and he said to him, Sir, I need a, a, a semi-truck. He said, Why do you need a semi-truck? He said, I want to bring back everything I've stolen. He even brought back an assault boat. We lived in the middle of the country. There wasn't any water there. He had stolen an army assault boat. He brought everything back. Think he had a testimony? He really did. And so, it's a marvelous thing, isn't it, when God so works that people want to put things right. And notice uh, what happens here. Verse 12, Then said they, 
we will restore them and will require nothing, nothing of them, so will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to the promise. Also I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even thus be shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And notice this, and the people did according to this promise. Harmony is restored amongst the people of God. Things have been put right. Now we can build again. And many of our assemblies, I wonder, unless things are put right, will they ever be able to build again? Or will it continue to fester until the Lord comes? Maybe tonight, maybe there's somebody you need to go to see to put things right. Maybe somebody's offended you. you know, so maybe you've offended them. Sometimes I found I've gone to speak to people. I sense there's something with them. They're not what they once were towards me. And I've gone to them. I said, is there anything? And I found out I offended them. I didn't even know I did it. Not easy. I mean, sometimes we can be offending someone. We don't even know it. And, and so, but you can tell. You can tell if things are not quite right with somebody. We want to go forward, build upwards. Maybe we've got to clear some rubbish out from the past. And that means mending broken relationships. There's a great healing in that. It's a tremendous thing. And it takes away the reproach. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want the Lord Jesus to be magnified? We don't want to be a reproach. We want him to be glorified. My breath is in heaven. My rest is not here.